Jai Ho. Yes, thank you, Chandrasheka, for taking your time. I know you have a tight schedule, but I really started to think I have to know more about this Billy Graham you have told me since a couple of weeks now, in connection, of course, um, to the Vaishnava teachings, in connection with our Hare Krishna movement. Hmm. So I thought I should just ask you some questions today, if you don't mind. My pleasure. And welcome, by the way, to everyone who is listening and watching this episode of Bhakti Today, which, as Paramshreya said, is, is uh, the topic of which is uh, the connection between uh, Billy Graham or evangelical Christianity in general and uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavism in the modern world. Exactly. Yes. You know, I'm from Germany, Chandrasekhar, and the cradle, Germany, the cradle of uh, of uh, Martin Luther. Yes, this is the case, and you know, Germany is not the U.S. where you are coming from, and we often have a quite, um, yeah, quite weird understanding what is an evangelical Christian. We mm. often have this idea. Oh, these are, you know, some fanatic Christians in the USA. Um, so, but I don't know if they are all that fanatic as we often think. Are there some different differences? I think go deeper into one of the, maybe the foremost um, famous evangelical Eric Graham, maybe you can deliver some background information. What is the evangelical church altogether? Um, the evangelical, Christian, evangelical Christianity is within the broader category of Protestant Christianity. Um, and what interests me and what, inter what I think should interest us as devotees of Krishna is not so much the theology that you know, fundamentalist or evangelical Christianity espouses vis-a-vis -vis a text which we respect, but which we don't uh, put on the same pedestal or put as much emphasis on as, say, the Bhagavad Gita or the Srimad Bhagavatam. I'm talking about the Bible. So in this short conversation, I'd like to say from the beginning that when I talk about the need or, yeah, the need to look into how you know, evangelical Christians uh, do their church, so to speak, I'm not talking about, you know, theology here. I'm not talking about uh, sectarian views about Jesus Christ, which I'll be the first to say, I think exists to a smaller or greater degree in, in those uh, evangelical circles, you know, like unless you believe Jesus, you go to hell forever. And so, and, and I may be stereotyping here, but, but the, we cannot deny that that exists. So I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is, let's put aside the theology here uh, and let's okay. look at, at how, evangelical Christians, quote unquote, do church. And I think this is how uh, devotees of Krishna, especially householders, could do church in ISKCON. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this evangelical Christianity, I think, is the biggest expression of Christianity in the United States. I think I so. Right? I think so. Yeah. The, 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 yep. I, would, I, would, I don't think you're wrong. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. To how much... Uh, how much percentage is approximately the evangelical um, That's a good question. Um, per, I'll just look it up. Per, percentage of evangelicals USA. Uh, tw let's see. 26% uh, are, are, that's not that much actually. 26% are evangelicals. 22% are, are uh, mainland, mainline Protestants. That's 16%. 23%. 2% are Catholics. Okay. So mainland uh, Protestant uh, Christians, they are way different? Or I, what is, you know, to tell you the is, truth, I don't, really, uh, I don't really care in a way. Like mm -hmm. I don't really care because, and because I, I don't know. Is, and and I don't is really it, know. But is it the same what we uh, are here in Germany, Protestants? Is this the same... Well, the root, the root category is the same. Now, 
I think we're getting into nitty gritty details of theological differences between mainline Protestants and okay. Orthodox, uh, what's it called, fundamentalist and evangelicals, and even they among themselves, you know, kind of fight with each other uh, with, among these theological differences, which I, I think should not, you know, bother us or should not be of our concern, because that's yeah. not what I want us to look at. Good. I, I, I see. Yeah, you are right. So then who is Billy Graham? That would be my first question because you have told me so much about him. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading this, uh, this audiobook uh, biography of his, which is a 36-hour audiobook. Mm -hmm. um, he, one could say, is the person who has preached Christianity second to Jesus most extensively in the history of Christianity. Of course, that's taking into consideration the technology and the media, you know, things right. that were available to him in the, in the 1940s and 1950s. He died a, one year ago. Um, mm -hmm. But they say that he, during his entire life, he reached, his message reached about 2.2 billion people. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. He was a, you know, a huge, huge figure um, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the Christian, Protestant, and specifically the evangelical Christian uh, circles. Um, according to his staff, you know, more than 3.2 million people uh, converted to, to his wow. you know, invitation at what he used to do called, called crusades, basically, you know, big pundal programs, <laughs> as we would call them, where he would invite newcomers to, you know, to accept Jesus as their personal savior and so on. So he was yeah. a very influential preacher who was the, the personal advisor of, of several U.S. presidents, uh, you know, including Obama, including Eisenhower, including uh, Johnson, Truman, uh, and, and Richard Nixon. So... Um, Mm -hmm. He's definitely a huge, huge, huge figure in modern Christianity, in modern Christian Protestant circles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just, yesterday I watched one show of him. It was somewhere in Chicago. And he said, this is the second biggest um, hall in the United States beside the Astrodome in Houston. And it was mm. really, packed. it was quite impressive. Yeah. So, so Chandra Shekhar, but why do you think that evangelical Christianity is the religious model among all religious models in the world today that most, yeah, what can we say, resembles the model of Lord Chaitanya's, what you call Navad Veep pastimes? Maybe, maybe before you answer that question, you could very shortly explain what do you mean by Navadvip pastimes. Hmm. I'm looking at this in terms of ashram and uh, in terms of clothes. <laughs> the Navadvip pastimes of Lord Chaitanya are the pastimes where Lord Chaitanya is a householder, is, is married, and he is the new leader of the Vaishnav community of Navadvip. It's those few years between his quote unquote conversion to bhakti. You know, the mm -hmm. Chaitanya literature is described that he performed the pastime of being a non-devotee, right? As he grew up, a, sort of an arrogant but highly attractive logician mm -hmm. whom, whom the Vaishnavas in Navadvip, such as Advaita Acharya and Srivas and Gadadhar, prayed among themselves that he would convert, that he would become a devotee. And we spoke about that in the past, just like if we imagine, you know, we could pray that, I don't know, a LeBron James or a, a Angela Merkel... <laughs> If it's a good example, uh -huh. but you know, imagine if a great personality like so and so would become a devotee. How great would that be? So that's how the Vaishnavas, the t the text describes, looked yes. at Nimai Pandit as this extremely brilliant, fantastic, attractive, and yet arrogant non-devotee. So from the moment where he goes back to Navadvip after his father's passing away, and mm -hmm. has this, you know, enlightening enlightenment moment where he becomes a devotee of Krishna to the time when he takes sannyas and leaves Navadvip as a sannyasi. Those are the Navadvip pastimes, we can say, of Lord Chaitanya. Of course, his okay. pastimes as a child in Navadvip are also in the Navadvip pastimes. But I'm specifically referring to his pastimes when he's actively the, the leader of the Vaishnava Sangha as a married man, as a married uh, Brahmin Vaishnava. 
those are the Navadvi okay. pastimes. And I think those are very important for ISKCON householders because mm -hmm. for ISKCON in general, because let's face it, most, the, the large, large, large majority of ISKCON membership is mm -hmm. made up of householders and always will be. Water yeah, seeks yeah. its own level. And we'll speak about this a little bit later on. Um, and, yes. and so therefore, those pastimes of Lord Chaitanya as a householder are the pastimes which the largest majority of ISKCON members can identify with, uh, with the figure of Lord Chaitanya as a householder preacher, as a householder uh, Vaishnav leader. So those mm -hmm. are the, the Navadvi so, pastimes of Lord Chaitanya. So we can say this period is, I think he came back from Gaya when he was 16 years old and he took sannyas when he was 24. Hmm. So we're talking eight years. So that's quite something. Right. It's not just, you know, one year or two years. It is really a well, substantial... He came back so young, huh? 16 is when his father passed away, huh? As far as I remember. Huh, for those For those learned watchers, they can type it in, in the comment section. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So, um, okay. Um, so why, why is evangelical Christianity the model mm -hmm. that resembles most the Navadvi pastimes? Exactly. Well, for two main reasons, I would say, or at least there's two reasons that I'd like to focus on. One of the reasons is that the Navadvi pastimes of Lord Chaitanya show us a type of Krishna consciousness where most of the preachers and gurus, shiksha or diksha, doesn't matter, are householders, including Nimai Pandit himself, including Lord Chaitanya himself. Now, when we look at the different models of religion today, um, immediately some of them are disqualified from the race or eliminated from the race, such as the Catholics, such as the um, Advaita Vedantist of Hinduism, such as certain branches of Buddhism, um, wherein you cannot be a priest or a guru or a spiritual figure unless you are a celibate monk. I so see. right away, right, those models are, are out of the picture. Right. Whereas Protestant Christianity, and they're not the only ones, but Protestant Christianity allows for men uh, and in some circles, women, to have the position of spiritual leader as a householder. So right. in Lord Chaitanya's Navadvi pastimes, the spiritual leaders are householders. Many of them are, at least it's perfectly allowed. Um, mm -hmm. And we see that in evangelical Christianity, most of the preaching is done precisely by householders. And for example, Billy Graham was you know, duly married and, and preached mm -hmm. his entire career of, of fabulous preaching. Um, as a householder. So that's number one. And number two, the second reason has to do with clothes. Um, mm -hmm. In evangelical Christianity, nobody has any type of religious uniform. Nobody in the congregation has any type of distinctive way of dressing that distinguishes them from non-devotees, right? Mm -hmm. And the spiritual leader, the pastor, as they call him, the guru, also, interestingly enough, does not dress in any way that distinguishes him from his congregation or from the rest of society. There is no religious uniform whatsoever, either for the congregation nor for the spiritual leader. And now when we look at different models of religion today, some other groups are eliminated. You know, the Amish are eliminated, the Sikhs are eliminated, the Hasidic Orthodox Jews are eliminated because they all have a religious uniform. Um, mm -hmm. Even the Orthodox Christians are eliminated and many or certain Protestant circles are also eliminated because their pastors or their priests, even though they may be married, have mm -hmm. some sort of uniform, at least at some time during their services. But the evangelical Christians have no uniform. And when we look at Navadweep, Lord Chaitanya's Navadweep pastimes, we have absolutely zero evidence that the Vaishnavas dressed in any way differently. You know, I'm not talking about their tilak and their tulsi beads, but just in terms of clothes, they did not distinguish themselves from non-Vaishnavas in Navadvi by the way they dressed. So you see, Paramashraya, for these two reasons, um, evangelical Christianity today, I think, is the model that resembles the most um, Lord Chaitanya's Navadvi pastimes. And uh, this 
you say in, 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 in the viewpoint that the evangelical Christianity in the United States is the most successful group of um, religion for the last, since the last, I think, 50 years or so, can we say it? Or There's even different statistics out there, but some numbers claim that the evangelicals are one of the only groups in North America that are basically at least maintaining their numbers and not declining drastically. Mm -hmm. So, in, because you can, you can fairly say that they are successful with their methods in some degree, with oh, their methods, with their, with their strategy. Definitely, yeah. And then therefore, and, and that's the whole crux of why I think that, you know, ISKCON devotees should look into how evangelicals do their, their thing, because not only do they historically resemble us the most, but they happen to be one of the most successful religious groups out there today. Good point. And I think you strongly connect this with the fact that they don't uh, use special uniforms foremostly and maybe other things. I remember that you often quote the first line of the Srimad Bhagavatam, verse 10, 14, three. I think stani, maybe third line. Yeah, the third line. There is this stani stita in stani stitaha in Sanskrit. And <clears throat> why, why are these words so relevant in your comparison of Vaishnavism with evangelical Christianity. So for those speakers who don't know what we're talking about, the 10th canto, chapter 14, verse 3, um, is a verse that is quite famous uh, and that starts with the words Gyane Prayasamudapastyanamanta Eva. And then there's a second line, Jivanti Sanmukaritam Bhavadiya Varta. And then the third line has the first two words, which are very, very important, and they are Stanistitaha. Um, this verse describes how, how one, while remaining in his established social situation, and that's what the word stanistitaha means, if mm -hmm. one, while remaining in his established social situation, in other words, while not changing anything externally, submits himself to oral reception of Krishna's message, he or she can conquer God or can conquer the Lord who is otherwise unconquerable. Wow. So not only does this verse talk about the process of becoming God conscious, but it, it has this very important point, which actually mm -hmm. Sachinandan Swami touched upon last summer when he spoke on this verse at the uh, Serbian camp festival. Um, mm -hmm while remaining in one's social situation. So this principle of not changing anything externally, especially for householders, is the fundamental, you know, the, everything starts with the Bhagavatam and then it trickles down to the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it trickles down to Lord Chaitanya's own example, and then it trickles down to, you know, the Acharyas in our tradition, and finally it trickles down to Prabhupada, the founder of ISKCON, right? So... Mm -hmm. Our behavior, our life ultimately has its, you know, bona fide or its justification in the Bhagavatam. So this statement, stanistitaha, we can say is the foundation of the, the, the entire principle of practicing Krishna consciousness according to time, place, and circumstance, according to local customs. Mm -hmm. So coming back to Navadvip and evangelical Christianity, in Navadvip, there's a certain way of dressing, for example, by everybody in Navadvip who are not Vaishnavas. The history tells us the Vaishnavas are a very small percentage of people in Navadvip. Everybody in Navadvip dresses in X way. The Vaishnavas come on the scene and they, they practice Krishna consciousness according to this principle of Stanistitaha, of following the local custom, just perhaps more in Sattva Guna. And that is exemplified by Lord Chaitanya himself, who dressed exactly like everybody else, even though he was a Vaishnava, a great leader. Same thing applies to all the other Vaishnavas in Navadvip. And so we see again the same principle in evangelical Christianity, where not only the congregation member, but even the pastor is 
living according to the Stanisti Taha principle, according to living their Christianity or their God consciousness, or in our case, our Krishna Bhakti, according to local customs. Yeah, right. I, I remember that when I watched a few of Billy Graham's um, sermons? sermons, yeah, sermons, he, yeah, I, I noticed that he was dressed very modestly, you know, not overdressed. He had a suit and tie, but he looked, you know, modest. And I looked into the audience. The audience often was uh, filmed too. And you could see that there was not a big gap between the, the guru, so to say, right. and, and, and the congregation. And uh, the, the, the biggest focus was indeed the message. Right. The message was the center from the very beginning. It was obvious for everyone that we don't talk about, you know, gaps and, you know, hierarchies expressed by dress. Hmm. But, hmm. but um, Billy Graham was, I think, respected for his dedicated um, life of preaching the gospel of Christianity. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, I would agree with you. So, mm, so why do you think that Billy Graham is a model that ISKCON householder preachers should emulate? That is one question. And what did Billy Graham do as a religious man and as a preacher that ISKCON householders preachers should also do? Well, that's a great question. Um, householders in Krishna consciousness, as opposed to monks, and but even monks have a, a big freedom of expression. But householders, we can say by definition, it's been coming back to this root verse of Stanisti Taha, have as the you know as a as a prerogative as an adhikar the freedom and and i would say say the the duty the preaching duty for the sake of suffering humanity to present themselves to the world to the non vaishnav world as being part of the world as being the same as the people that they're trying to bring to krishna mm -hmm. so in ISKCON today, even though we have, I would say, you know, fantastic householder preachers, and let me give you some names, Vaisheshika Prabhu, um, Chaitanya Chandra Charan Prabhu, um, Kalakanta Prabhu, Prithu Prabhu when he was, you know, more active, um, Madhavananda, we have uh, Rajabasi in Ukraine, we have an increasing number of householders who are, we would say, empowered, right? Or anointed, <laughs> to use a Christian term, by Krishna to um, preach and to become gurus in their own right. But, and I'm saying this with all respect, especially, and, and not just respect, but with great admiration for the bhakti, for the devotion, for the purity of heart of these individuals, okay? Because I want to make that clear. I'm not, I don't want to insult anyone or offend anyone, um, because these devotees that I just mentioned, I sincerely admire and, and respect. None of them, however, have yet come to the stage of presenting themselves to the modern world, at least in terms of their dress, in a way that, for example, Billy Graham and other evangelical Christians have. In other words, the principle of Stanisti Taha hasn't been yet fully embraced, at least in terms of dress code, from the point of view of householder preachers in ISKCON. They just don't. Who, how, who out there in, in ISKCON leadership is you know, a householder preacher who dresses always like a modern Western gentleman? We don't see it yet. We don't see it yet. And mm -hmm. so I think that ISKCON householders who, are, who feel called to preaching, to ministry work, should really consider this point of Stanisti Taha and look at Lord Chaitanya's own example in the Vaishnavas in Navadvip 
and and ask themselves okay what's the best way to is to embody this principle of stanisitaha and and dress and present myself in such a way that i'm embodying this principle by my own body language that hey you don't need to change anything you can you know stanisitaha you can remain in your social situation and yet become very krishna conscious and even you know a very advanced spiritual leader so specifically what did billy graham do that could inspire householder preachers in iskon well for one thing uh, he was a, a an ideal householder in other words he was married one time and he remained married one time and you know he performed his duties towards his family responsibly uh, he didn't cheat on his wife so he was you know a very upright husband and a very dedicated man in, in his own spiritual tradition you know had tremendous faith in the words of the bible now whether you know whether we as vaishnavas accept the bible as he did is another issue but in his own right he had tremendous faith in his own religious scripture and he really dedicated his life to helping others come to what he considered to be um, the the way the person the savior and uh, jesus uh, so that they could stop suffering and stop you know their trajectory to hell so to speak and get salvation and go to heaven and so on and so in krishna consciousness a, a preacher has this a similar a similar meditation how can i use my life my money my resources my intelligence to uh, be an instrument in krishna's hands to help others other souls you know come closer to krishna mm -hmm. so i think he's a great example for householders in iskon and especially those house householders who don't see yet in iskon um you know ideal um examples of western householder preachers who dress like normal western gentlemen which as i said we haven't seen yet even though these are you know we have great householder preachers they haven't taken that step and they're still i would say stuck if i may dare use that word in a indian dress style presentation just in white color as opposed to saffron and i think that's a great disadvantage to to reaching out to the very people that you're trying to save because um billy graham he gives the common people the a message that you can be a dedicated christian like i am but simultaneously totally fit in today's society isn't that what lord chaitanya told raghunath you know raghunath das goswami one of the six goswamis of vrindavan Mm -hmm. was a householder and the first time he goes to see lord chaitanya lord chaitanya tells him don't be a crazy fellow go back home this is stated in the chaitanya charitamrita go back mm -hmm. home and perform your duties and practice your krishna consciousness inwardly in such a way that externally no one will even notice that you're krishna conscious It's right there in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Kaviraj Goswami says that Lord Chaitanya instructed Raghunath in that sense, in that way. Okay. Now some may argue, but that could not be our um, job, or that should not be our. That should not be the message of Lord Chaitanya to us, because we should actively preach the holy name. Um, Okay, so, but, preaching but the holy maybe, name is one thing, but but maybe another example is this Kurma Brahmana from South India. Good, I think he is a better example um, because he was ordered actively to actively preach Krishna consciousness. Raghunath Das Goswami, there were some other issues involved, but I think Kurma Brahmana he is he is the he is a better. Um, example, maybe you can elaborate a little bit about Kurma, the well, Brahman of Kurma. Maybe you can. Mm. He also wanted, as far as I remember, he wanted to join actively into Lord Chaitanya's movement. That meant at that time, Lord Chaitanya was not anymore in the Grihastha ashram. Right. He was a sannyasi. He was a sannyasi and he traveled all around India as a sannyasi, um, 
wandering or pilgrim pilgrimating yeah i don't know if that's a word a verb but <laughs> so going on pilgrimage going on pilgrimage from one holy place to to the other one to the next one and preached um krishna consciousness in a way that sannyasis often do they go from village to village they don't stay longer at one place than three days according to narada muni in the bhagavatam so when kurma brahmana met lord chaitanya in south india i think it was near rangakshetra somewhere there in south india some holy spot he had immediately that idea oh i should immediately join lord chaitanya in this on his uh, in other words give up, give up my family and become a renunciate mendicant yes. and travel with lord chaitanya as a sannyasi travel with, travel with lord chaitanya and what lord chaitanya then told him is no you should remain here and um remain a grihastha and maintaining your responsibilities and simultaneously preach the gospel of krishna consciousness right so and as far as i i know he was pretty successful in his way right yeah as a matter so of fact that, we hear from the chitana charitam that lord chitanya travel and that's how he he would embrace somebody who would become ecstatic with love of god and go back to his village and embrace others who would also become ecstatic with love of god and they would go and embrace others who would themselves become ecstatic in love of god and never do we hear that in the process of becoming ecstatic with love of god they had to somehow start wearing a different type of wardrobe or drastically mm -hmm. changing their external appearance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is quite interesting. I have maybe one last important question. Um, why do you think that the future success of ISKCON in the West lies in how the, the evangelical... Can you repeat your question again? Because the, there, was a, a, there was a little slow in internet connection and I couldn't hear your question. So for the sake of our hearers, our listeners... Sure. Why do you think that the future success of ISKCON in the West lies in householders emulating the evangelical Christian model? Okay, because I think that most of the preaching will increasingly be done by householders. This is not to minimize the brahmachari or sannyasi ashram, which I'm sure will always exist and hopefully will continue to produce Uh, wonderful preachers, traveling mendicants who hopefully will have less of a managerial role and more of an actual itinerant preacher kind of role. That's why I very much commend, you know, sannyasis like Yadunandan Swami or uh, oh, I would say even Indra those who like don't want to get involved in management. Some even go to the extent of not wanting to initiate, like for example, Banu Swami. He refuses to give initiation because he believes that initiation should be a job of a householder. So anyway, that's another topic. But uh, so not to to minimize the the you know the the greatness of or the importance or the reality of the brahmachari and sannyasi ashram, but you'll agree that as time goes on, the proportion of householders in ISKCON will become greater and greater and greater compared to the to the you know, percentage of brahmacharis and sannyasis, you see water seeks its own level. And in Krishna consciousness, like in Protestant Christianity, and in actually most of the tradition, most of the monotheistic traditions, people are allowed to get married and not just allowed to get married and you know, go back to the spiritual world when they die, but they can, if they feel called, become you know, gurus or teachers in their own right from the platform of householder life. And, and so therefore, you know, water seeks its own level. Most people in humanity, most humans get married. And so therefore, it's just only, it's just common math that the large majority of ISKCON members will increasingly be householders. And out of those, um, many will be called to, uh, to act as, as gurus, as we're already seeing more and more with the names that I mentioned, right? And so... 
so therefore it's the the preaching will mostly be done um, by householders now having said that from my studies of the the history of religious conversion in other words from my academic studies and having and seeing you know our own tradition how acharyas adjusted according to time and place and seeing in the last you know in the in the 40 50 year history of iskon i see a very clear principle and it is this paramshreya the more cultural difference and when i talk about cultural difference i'm not talking about moral principles such as you know chastity and you know, avoiding me eating meat and you know avoiding sinful life i'm not talking about that what i'm talking about in terms of cultural differences i'm talking about differences such as food um architecture music or instrument in, musical instrumentations sitting on the floor or sitting in chairs and i would say very much so clothes or dress so the more cultural differences there are between two different groups on these points that i just mentioned the harder it is for people of one group to convert or to adopt the spirituality of the people of this group. We see it again and again and again historically. And conversely, the more similarities there are, culturally speaking, between two groups, the easier it is for the message, as you mentioned, of you know, group A, let's say, to get transmitted to the people of group B and for people of group B to adopt the spirituality of people of group A. That's why, historically speaking, always, you know, whether Vaishnava or Catholic or Protestant uh, or maybe Muslim, but they use, you know, they, they use force a lot. <laughs> but those who are not violent in their preaching um, have always adapted with, the, with these points of dress and, and food and culture, external culture, with the local place where they were preaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's why, you know, Narutam Das Thakur changed the language to vernacular Bengali from Sanskrit because then people in Bengal who didn't know Sanskrit could understand. I mean, that's what Mar Martin Luther, you know, translated the Bible into German. Uh, that's why Prabhupada traveled in airplanes and wrote in English. I mean, the list goes on and on. That's why Bhakti Siddhanta wrote in a car. So historically speaking, in every tradition, especially ours, there's this... And Narada Muni himself talks about time, place, and circumstance right there in the Bhagavatam. So starting with this premise that I just described, a householder preacher will find that his or her, his um, efforts to, as you say, to you know, transmit the message of Krishna's teachings, his effort will be a lot easier and will receive a lot more favorable response from a local congregation, not, not, you know, the Indian diaspora, you know, the Indian diaspora is welcome to ISKCON, obviously. But when we're talking about a local Western audience, I'm convinced I may be wrong, but history seems to be on my side and all, you know, observations and research has seems to be on my side. And the example of our own Acharya seems to be on our side shows that the more you are, like the people you're preaching to in terms of, you know, these external things, the more easy it is for people to listen to your message and to adopt Krishna consciousness. So I think the more householder preachers and even, you know, monks who occasionally will, you know, not wear the, the saffron robes, but wear a suit and tie like you often do, or like we see, you know, Bhakti Tirta Swami did or Ridai Nanamar does or, Bhakti Sarup Damodara Goswami at his academic conferences, you know, dressing in for what monks would call secular dress, but which for, which for householders would just call normal dress, because there's no such thing as a religious dress to begin with for householders. The more they do that, the more they'll find their, uh, their preaching to be successful and effective. And mm -hmm. that's why I believe that the more householder preachers in this gone take, take heed, take the example of preachers like Billy Graham, sticking to, of course, their own moral principles and the Siddhanta of the Srimad Bhagavatam and Prabhupada's books, the more successful they will be in their efforts to spread Lord Chaitanya Sankirtan movement and, you know, through ISKCON. I see, I see. Okay. Yes. Very interesting. Thank you. Now I, am, I have a better insight why you are so um, enthusiastic and inspired by Billy Graham, in connection uh, of the 
strategy of the Hare Krishna movement. Yes, thank you. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for everyone for listening. So maybe our watchers, they like to give their opinion. We would be curious, I think, what their opinion is and also what our next topic of Bhakti today should be. We've I made have... a vow. This is, let's make it public. We made an agreement. Param Shreya and I made an agreement that we'll publish a podcast of Bhakti today every two weeks. So now that we're saying this publicly, we, we cannot humiliate ourselves <laughs> and rescind on our, on our vow. Okay, he is saying it. I, I try my best. I cannot make a vow, but I try. He my did. Best. He made a vow. He promised already. <laughs> okay, I cannot remember, but okay. No, not try. true. Not true. Believe, believe me, he promised. Okay. So, what should we uh, speak f about uh, for the next time? My proposal is the importance or these the significance of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Let's talk about the Srimad Bhagavatam. Great idea. Good. So next topic, guys, is the Srimad Bhagavatam. And thanks for watching. And thanks for you. watching. See you all later.